Last time we talked about some histor very deep historical context for uh, fisheries. And so today I want to talk about some more, um, uh, the, the more modern state and some of the issues and concerns we have from a, a sort of mile high perspective in terms of fisheries management. So first to review the stuff we talked about from last time, um, we mentioned that historical data can be very helpful and it can help us frame our current predicament, our current uh, setting that we're in. We also said that uh, history uh, may help us with uh, planning a restoration of a fish stock or some various uh, management strategies. We, we mentioned that, that history isn't perfect, but, but that it, it, uh, it may in some contexts be helpful. Again, not, not perfect because our third bullet, the extant coastal zone, our current, our current world we're living in, is in many dimensions different from the coastal world that existed for our forebears, right? So things have changed a lot. So that's one of the reasons why that history isn't necessarily a quote unquote literal blueprint for us to, to get back and, and becomes more of a, a guide or a suggestion or a way to gain insight. Um, we talked last time about overfishing being one of the primary causes of of marine ecosystem collapse. Uh, Jeremy Jackson and others say it is the, it is the primary thing. Um, I'd say the, the, the full jury is still out on that, but it's at least, uh, at least one of the primary things, if not the. He would say the, but it's, it's at least really, really um, important, or has been important. And then just lastly, the takeaway from all those conversations last time was the simple fact that overfishing, and from our fish banks example that you guys all ran, that overfishing um, really, and, and sort of eliminating different elements of our ecosystems really highlights um, the, the importance of all those members of our diverse ecosystem for the proper functioning of, and, and resilience of those ecosystems. So when we have these disturbances, when we have the uh, you know, Hurricane Sandys and the Harveys and the Irmas and all these uh, discrete perturbations without a really healthy, robust ecosystem, it can take a long time for that system to recover. If not, have that system be knocked into some alternative stable state, usually with lower productivity, lower diversity, lower, lower ability to provision human society and things like that. Cool? Any questions about that stuff from before? Okay, great. So given that it is, you know, Halloween, I thought we'd start with a little quick, super quick, uh, little uh, funny little video here. Let's see if we can do this. Oh, what? Ads. So of course the man has to do it because you know of course he's a dude. And then of course you have to go handle wildlife with a weapon. Good focus. HD cinematography. Oh, snap! Oh, uh oh, what's going to happen? Lots of technology being deployed.
Oh, snap! Yeah, technology! Okay, well, there you go. <laughs> oh, what Wait, what's the ending? Yeah. Did you watch a movie? Didn't he die? <laughs> he lived. <laughs> 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 Did he die? I'm saying, who's Jeff Rosola? Okay, did he live or die? You guys have to watch the full movie to check it out. But, uh, you know, there you go. A little bit about our, our, our interaction with marine or, or aquatic uh, resources. So uh, maybe that was a fishery for the creature from Black Lagoon. So what is a fishery? We touched on this last time. A fishery is, uh, firstly, let's disabuse ourselves of the fish in that term. You might think that a fishery refers to a a group of fish, a population of fish, or a so-called stock of fish, and that would be a totally fine thing. But realize that the term fishery refers to anything from an aquatic environment that we pull out. It could be an invertebrate. For that matter, it could be algae. So, so fishery doesn't just refer to fish, quote unquote, to vertebrates. But when we talk about fishery, um, uh, the, the, excuse me, the fishery or, or, or a fishery, there's a couple different or a few different components that, that comprise that fishery. It's the resource itself, which most, if we're using a, a typical example, it's called the, the tuna or whatever, the, the fish itself. The area where those critters live, right? And so by definition, where an organism lives, we call that the habitat. So we would refer to, uh, there's a habitat component to a fishery. And then uh, also, especially in the context of BSRM and, and how we think of things, people are a key integral part of this, of this fishery. So we don't think of it as the nature part over there and the human part over here. We think of these things as an integrated whole, or at least an interacting uh, uh, unified group of, um, of folks. And in the context of what these fisheries provide us, there's a bunch of things. But first and foremost, these things are food for us. For some of us in the wealthier parts of the world, it's a nice thing. Should we have salmon tonight, right? That kind of a thing. But for many folks in the world, this is a key thing. This is where they're getting their, their core dietary protein. So. It's about 3 billion people get at least about a fifth of their protein annually from marine coastal fisheries. We, we you know, of course we get deer and all this and that, but, but by and large, fisheries are the, are the big mover and shaker when we talk about animal proteins um, for much of the world. And if when we talk about when we talk about um, uh, our populations that live immediately in the coastal zone, that's much higher. That typically goes more like 30% of their protein or, or even, even greater, upwards of 80, 90%, uh, depending on what population and what part of the world we're talking about. Um, and so these, these critters are, are sold in different areas. I want to show you one more quick video. So uh, Tsukiji on the left, which is the famous, the largest fish market in the world on the left, is, that's in Tokyo. And then um, the biggest one in the US, which I took uh, last year's class to in Honolulu near the airport, which is the Honolulu Fish Auction. I'll show you guys a really super quick, just a two, three minute uh, video here so you get the idea of that. Bad sound. Major tuna fish auction in the United States. Well, the sound here is, is fairly poor. But so this is uh, this is these guys offloading their catch or or, or offloading some of their catch. This is at the harbor, the docks. And this is a tour you guys can go on. And then this is uh, a little holding bin just outside of the auction, so on the, on the uh, area outside the chilled warehouse where the auction takes place. Who's catching it? We know that everyone in the 
mahi. So that's mahi mahi right there. Dolphin fish get all that ass. Tuna, big eyes, and yellow. Mostly tuna is in there. So this, is, so this is inside the auction. So these guys, uh, for hours on end until they run out of tuna, all these fish, have, all these ships have landed, and they drop their drop their catch on these pallets. They're iced, they're individually labeled, and guys like a zipper walk up and down the aisles, and they're bidding. They're, and they're on the cell phone getting the current, uh, current bid price. So these guys all have auction tags on them. So. So you can look up and you'll see, uh, yeah, so on the upper right there, those are the auctioneers. And these guys right, are going down, like a tour. zipper they go down. But so those guys, guys are auctioning back right there. there. So they're okay, sitting there, you know, these are X dollars a pound, X dollars a pound. They're looking at the quality, in this case, yeah, tuna, they're the looking at the quality first, of the meat. Then uh, lower quality tuna uh, after that. And then they'll end with the um, bycatch, the opa, and whatever else they have. So now with these tuna, they've cut them out. So we can see the muscle, the quality of the muscle tissue. They've also cored it. This is the name of the, the boat, the weight of the um, fish. We also have a barcode, so we can track. We have traceability here in this fishery. Uh, so what they're going to look for here is the quality, and that's going to drive the price. So the prices are really su um, suppressed right now because we get a lot of a lot a lot of uh, 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 tuna in the market right now. So these guys are going to look for they look for quality. Quality of this stuff, right? So, the, so they want firmness, not smushy. They want clear, not opaque. They want deep red, uh, not uh, burned. So this here is the, it's, it's a bit of burn of the, the muscle. The um, guy was uh, pumping too much blood, and and it's not as good. So these guys are going to go through. They're going to be bidding. It's, it's an auction. Anybody that can bring in money can bid. And uh, these guys are. Uh, going up and down all the time, starting at 5.30, and it's going to go until they run out of fish. So these guys are auctioning, and he's going to call it the price, and he's going to go higher, higher, higher. And then when the bidder gets the right ones, he'll, he'll uh, put his trash. This, but they won't sell the trash. This is his price for him. Mostly uh, 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 there, there could be a, a chef or so in there. Mostly, it's mostly Uh, no, no, no. Uh, yeah, so so uh, if you guys are interested in that, I have, I have more videos I can show you guys. I'll, I'll, I'll put some more up uh, later. But um, uh, this is open to the public, this tour. So back in 1997, when I took my first class there, um, it was just, I walked them around, it was just me. And since then, uh, this nonprofit has formed, which is what the gentleman you saw that was sort of talking at least a little bit in there. Um, uh, he's a CSU alum, pretty cool, uh, but uh, he basically leads these tours. So now, if you're just Joe Blow public, you can't just walk in like I used to do 20 years ago. So you have to go with a tour, but it's super cool. He does it, uh, they do it like three or four days a week, um, uh, really neat. And you guys, uh, the whole tour goes for maybe two and a half hours or so. It's, it's a really, um, really fun thing. So if you guys, next time you guys are in Honolulu, even if you're just on a, you know, half day layover, I would strongly encourage you guys to go uh, check it out. It's really uh, pretty cool. Again, it's the largest such auction uh, in the US. It's, it's nowhere near as large as the, as the massive market in Tokyo, but it's, it gives you a sense of the commerce going on here and, uh, and all the activities associated with a fishery. Uh, so we talk about these offshore waters, these distant waters, and those are important. That's where a lot of our big tunas and things sometimes are. Uh, but really, the majority of the action when we talk about fisheries is relatively close in to shore. 
And by shore, I'm talking about in, in the um, territorial waters of our countries. And so there, for, there we're talking about 200 nautical miles or closer. And again, that's where the vast, vast, vast majority of our uh, marine fisheries are landed, are captured. Um, now, these areas have uh, a couple, uh, there's a reason why we have some of the most productive fisheries in these areas. One, we have the upwellings you guys know about, right? That's when the wind blows and it tends to bring up this colder, nutrient-rich, oxygen-rich water from deeper up into the shallow areas that tends to promote phytoplankton, which then in turn tends to promote zooplankton, which then in turn feeds the you know, little fish and on and on and on. So upwellings are one of the reasons. Um, also, these guys are, tend to be over continental shelves, so relatively shallow water. And also, this opens up uh, the importance of estuaries and or uh, either some, some of this fishing activity is actually inside our larger estuaries. If we look at Louisiana, a lot of the, the great uh, uh, landings there, the oysters, the shrimp, et cetera, are coming from those, those estuarine conditions. But also those estuaries um, are also important nurseries for the juvenile stages for a lot of our uh, fish and, so they, and, and other critters. And so they um, are important um, sources of babies in many cases. Generally speaking, we as a species tend to think that things that are higher up on the trophic pyramid uh, tend to be tastier. So we tend, to, we tend to default to eating relatively high up on a food web as opposed to eating more towards the base of the food web. And so this is just a, an illustration that a terrestrial versus uh, aquatic or terrestrial versus marine uh, example. But it's the same thing. I mean, it's, you, you guys all get this is basic ecology. Um, and in this example, this is an example from the North Atlantic. Again, one of the cases where we talked about uh, last time really being um, a classic example of overfishing where we, where we nuked our, our cod and haddock and those guys. Um, and so what you guys see, so here, here, here's a, a historic North Atlantic um, food web. And so we, there's a lot, firstly, there's a lot of parts here, right? So guys are interacting. Ener things are being eaten, energy is flowing to different, uh, different organisms from other organisms, etc. And the typical guys that we would target, for example, are the circled, circled guys over there. And increasingly, a, a, a very common fisheries management tool or approach that we've taken um, in, in recent years is to look at the trophic level is, is to assign trophic levels to these different critters and then um, and use that in terms of modeling, in terms of predictions, in terms of talking about where we're directing our effort to. And so that's what's being illustrated here on the right. So first, first levels is the base of the food web, the primary producers. And then as we essentially go up, we add a level. Because many of these critters are, are not feeding at only the lower level, Right? They're sort of feeding in betwixt between. They're, they're omnivorous to a, to a degree. Um, rarely do we have an organism that is at exactly one or exactly two. Well, well one, you get one. But, but once you leave the, the first level, uh, right, we, we tend to get these um, betwixt between numbers. So for example, right here, we have Atlantic cod that comes in at 3.5. Which you know, was like, what's 3.5? It's sort of half of a trophic level. Yes, energetically speaking, yes. It's kind of, it's it's in that uh, betwixt between. So, for example, snapper is 4.6. Cod, Atlantic cod, I mean, is um, 3.5. Uh, Atlantic herring is 3.1. Uh, sardines 2.5, etc. And so this this helps us understand a bit um, some of the consequences when we when we over harvest or or um, have some change regulation on these critters. Generally speaking, 
Again, we're gonna, we like to eat at the higher level there. We like to eat these, these tasty things. We tend to not eat the diatoms, yeah. at least not currently. Mm. We're working hard to make sure everybody just eats diatoms as a society, but you know, um, uh, not willfully, but just because we're taking everything else out. So, so but you know, given, given uh, left to our own devices, we're gonna eat um, uh, that higher up level. So we have, um, oftentimes in fisheries management, we tend to talk about the stock. Historically, we've talked about the stocks in terms of where they lived. So, for example, the two most basic breakdowns would be demersal or pelagic uh, species. And so we build the management schema around what we're talking about. So sometimes instead of demersal, you hear the term ground fish, which is a very common term for. Uh, folks in the fishery world. So those are, those are critters uh, uh, either living straight on the bottom, like halibut and things like that, or relatively tightly associated with the bottom, not up in the water column, just swimming willy-nilly. And that would be contrasted with more of the so-called open water species or the pelagic species. That would be more of our mackerels and, and tuna and things like that. So we generally come up with management, or, or the first wave of management schemes were based on so-called ground fish and pelagic uh, species, primarily because the fishing method that we use to extract these critters tends to get more than just one. It's, it's an uncommon method that's highly, highly selective and only takes one species. More typically, for example, if we drag a net along the bottom to pick up the benthic associated critters, we're not just gonna get the one species, we're gonna get a lot of the guys that live down there. And so therefore, the, the management has taken the tact of, okay, we're gonna, we're gonna manage all these guys based on where they live. Does that make sense? Yeah. One more uh, note to history. We talked a lot about history last time, but um, this is one thing we didn't touch on yet. So we talked about pretty much long ago history. This is a bit more recent history, stuff that we've actively taken a role in in the modern era. And so there's a quote I have up here, until recently in the balance between productivity of fish populations and people, and, and, and people's ability to catch fish, the fish were favored, right? Um, so let's look at this. So this is like post-World War II on the bottom, post-World War II till modern era. So World War II on the left, going to the modern time on the right. And then um, the, of the stuff we were taking, how things broke down. And have, have a look at the terminology, which is incredibly telling here. W what are those different terms for those different phases? What do you guys see those words up there? Undeveloped. Undeveloped. As, as if... As, as if it's wasted or something, right? Again, that's a lot of the same thinking that was driving you guys in fish banks, right? Not, not healthy, abundant fish, right? But rather, you know, underutilized, undeveloped, you know, not yet exploited. That, those types of terminologies. And make no mistake, those terms really implied um, uh, behavior, right? So we have, uh, so if we look at this, we start with a relatively high proportion of, of so-called undeveloped um, uh, fisheries. As we go through time, we start quote unquote developing those fisheries. And what we're developing is not building more population, we're developing our ability to suck those critters out of the ocean, yeah? Okay. So we, we start off that, with that undeveloped phase, and then we hit this sort of beginning to work on it phase, the so-called developing phase. And then from there, we enter the so-called mature. <laughs> so okay, we, 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 we've, we're taking, we have a lot of capacity to take, and we are taking these critters out of the system. And then senescent, you might also call overfished, or, or extinct, <laughs> or, or, or driven to uh, non-abundance, whatever, wh whatever the phrase you want to add on there. But have a note, it's interesting that those are the four phases, right? 
the fourth phase isn't an optional phase. The fourth phase is, is a, is a, like you know that's number four. It's not it's not three A or three B. It's it's widely recognized as a common phenomenon of this historic approach to managing. So you might think, hmm, maybe that's not the best approach to this, this historic way of, of thinking about stuff. And a lot of this is built around so-called MSY, or maximum sustainable <laughs> yield. More on that in a bit. So I have, I just uh, pulled off this weekend the newest, uh, the newest report. And so this, this, these numbers need to be updated. But, but just to give you a sense, so again, to be clear, these numbers aren't the current numbers, but it serves to make the point. Um, about a decade ago, more than half of the world's fish stocks were quote unquote fully exploited. Again, we're still using this terminology. Th this terminology and this, this thought of, um, of, of thinking about the exploitation of these resources, fully exploited. And then 25% were overexploited or depleted. You know that as basically overfished. So when, we, when you get there, assuming this is right, and there are, there are a lot of problems with data, let's just assume this data is right. In 2004, right, we're talking about 77% of things were either maximally fished or we were, we were sucking too many of them out of the ocean to be sustainable, right? So we're harming the future production. So the vast, vast, vast majority is maxed out at, at a minimum, if not over, if, if not already maxed out. Does that make sense? Yes. So that's a key point. The next is uh, widely understood now, this wasn't understood so much so 20 years ago, but now it's widely understood that a lot of those top trophic levels, those big killer whales, white sharks, those kind of top, in our case, uh, giant sea bass on our coast, those critters, um, are not around. And not only are they not around here in California, they're not around in Louisiana, they're not around in New York, they're not around in Japan. It, it's, it's a global phenomenon where we've taken out a lar lot of these large bodied uh, top carnivores, top predators. That's going to have impact. You're absolutely correct, right? <laughs> absolutely. Absolutely. Um, in the case of the US, um, we tend to have, uh, and, and this, gets, this gets controversial, and people have very strong opinions about this. And it depends on how we define exploitation, sustainability, et cetera. But, um, even the Secretary of Commerce, and remember that NOAA is under the Department of uh, Commerce, right, for historic reasons. Um, even those folks acknowledged um, around the turn of the century that a lot of our fish stocks were not being managed super well. So too many organisms were being sucked out and in 2002, in particular, for us, um, our West Coast ground fish uh, populations were uh, described as being in a, in a state of disaster, according to the Secretary of uh, Commerce. So not, not you know, some weird, freaky environmental group or whatever, but sort of the mainstream of the, of the government was in, in George W. Bush's administration was saying that there's a problem with these resources. So that suggests that things were not ideal. Um, and then it's also really important for you guys to understand that we've not significantly added to the global uh, uh, increase in terms of wild caught fish really since the 80s. Our, our global population is going up, but we haven't been catching more fish. Uh, one, because we basically fished, we got guys everywhere now, we reach across the globe. One, and two, if somebody does invent a new thing or, or find a new fish, um, we are taking too much out of other areas so we're not adding uh, more biomass to our, to our take. So uh, this is sort of the takeaway. I don't know if anybody's read the stuff I, I posted yet, but um, so so where so but we are adding to 
fish derived protein, where's that coming from? Are the are what? Right, mariculture, aquaculture. So farming, cultivation of fish. That's where we're getting the increases since the 80s. More and more of our fish protein comes from the husbandry. Again, this isn't, this isn't uh, uh, new to you guys. This is just one example, again, of the classic case, what's now the classic case, which is the Atlantic a cod fishery off the East Coast. New England, and we talked, we touched on this last time, but basically uh, for, for hundreds and hundreds of years, we're fishing this fish, and it's all good, and it's one of the reasons why the American colonies were colonized, so that people could get at this resource. This was a fish that you could take dry and, and salt it before we had refrigeration, and it was a transportable protein, um, very, very important, and we managed to drive that to collapse. We killed it. And, and cod is the big story, but there's all, all kinds of other um, fisheries have experienced collapse as well. Okay, so why have, why have these uh, coastal marine fisheries um, declined? Uh, a few reasons, first and foremost, overfishing, as we've talked about last time and, and touched on here. And, and you guys know this, but overfishing is when um, we, t we take more, we kill more fish then can be replaced by the system. Note that that is uh, what we take out to eat, but in terms of the ecosystem, it's what we kill and use and also what we kill and don't use. So what we kill and don't use is our bycatch, the stuff that was unintended to be harvested or harmed, but because of our fishing practice, it was. So we have, over, we have uh, first and foremost, overfishing, taking too many individuals out. Secondly, uh, we have more and more efficient technology. So back in the day, um, we could go out and um, put a fishing pole in the water and wait for a while, wait for a while and get a fish and okay, pull them in and get it, right? When we caught that fish, there was probably, who the heck knows, another 50 fish that were swimming around that were like, damn, I'm not gonna eat that. Right? Have George in it. Hey, George, go eat it. Okay, I'll eat that. I'm like, oh, yeah, George, idiot, right? You got eaten. <laughs> Nowadays, our technology is such that we're, we can quite literally look and see all the fish in this area and deploy our fishing efforts such that we get all the fish in that area. So we're much, much more efficient. So give me some examples of some of the technology that, um, that makes us so efficient at, at capturing fish. What does it say again? Trawling. Uh, okay, trawling. What, 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 so, okay, so one, trawling, we've, we've had trawling for centuries, but what, what about our modern trawling is different? Okay, okay, so in some cases, so things like monofilament and, and, and some like, like uh, more cryptic, more cryptic uh, fishing efforts, but there's a better one. Um, what about sonar and radar? Sonar radar could, but hold on that for a second. Well, let, let's keep with the, with the trawl. Motorized. Motorized. Steve got it. I'm sorry, you're, you're going to say? I was going to say fish finders. Like, like commercial boats will just like be motorized. Good. So hold that for a second. Hold that for a second. But, but, but Steve had it. So it's, it's the ability to have these incredibly powerful diesel powered, electric powered winches. A lot of that technology came out of World War II. And so now it's not just a net. You, last time we watched the, the Spanish tuna fishermen guys where they were actually physically hauling in the net right with their backs and uh, now all of this stuff is done with electric winches you know mechanical winches and so so now instead of hauling in a thing that maybe weighs a couple hundred pounds and is really hard for you know big buff dudes to pull on in now we can pull in you know orders of magnitude heavier nets with orders of magnitude more fish in there because we can physically lift them out of the water so the mechanical um, advantage is a key thing. Some other technology you guys were just mentioning. So tell me about fish finders. What's, what's that? They'll just like stop. Everybody throws their lines in and they, and they pull them out. And right. So his, of charter boats that like pull exactly. So historically, you had to go and fish all over the place and then realize, oh my gosh, when we go and fish in this one area off this 
off this bluff or whatever, we tend to get more fish. So we'll go there, right? So using history to guide where you go, your so-called fishing hole or your fishing spot, right? Now, using, um, in, in the case of the fish finder, acoustics, and we're like, hello, and it goes down, and it hits a fish and it pops back, and oh my gosh, there's a signal there, right? So we see there's a mass of fish. And increasingly, these things are very powerful, very sophisticated stuff. The kind that you guys can slap on your boat and just go out that costs a couple hundred bucks will give you a signal. But the higher end stuff will actually even paint the picture of the, of the, the fish. You could sometimes tell you know, the size of it, the, in some cases, the species of it. Really amazing technology. So we actually literally can see into the ocean. What else? What are some other technologies that are really helpful? Or, the, or that make us super efficient. Mm -hmm. So more sophisticated nets and and uh, things of that nature, the actual tools to capture the organism. Um, like the ability to tell the temperature of the ocean. So uh huh. Like, yes. Like warmer waters. Are mm -hmm. coast, they'll, they'll Absolutely. And not just the temp, not just putting a thermometer in the ocean, because we've been able to do that for a long time, but it's to be able to instantaneously look at the temperature of the ocean across California in real time. In real time. So a lot of our fish, we, if you guys recall back to our discussion of, of uh, the, the you know, physical oceanography 101, oceanography 101, marine biology 101, we talked about the structure in the ocean. There's different clines, these different these different masses of water. Now, we, a lot of times, what we didn't talk about is that line between the water coming from the coast and the water in the ocean, that acts as a front that concentrates stuff, concentrates little pieces of wood, maybe nutrients. And so a lot of critters are like, damn, I'm going to hang out here, right? So now we can see those by looking at the chlorophyll or looking at the other med surface temperature, other things like that from satellites real time popped right under your dashboard of the, of the vessel that you're driving. So you can, you can drive straight across the ocean and see where it is right now. Maybe in an hour that, that area will have moved so we can really zero in on where the, con the conditions that tend to attract fish. So amazing technology. So what do I have here? Okay, so uh, that fishing vessels, oh, I didn't mention that. So right, more and more powerful vessels that can go farther and farther offshore for longer periods of time more powerful engines. We mentioned the gear like the, like the, the uh, winches and things. Radar and sonar we touched on. Again, direct, all, almost all these things come directly out of World War II. Radar was invented to uh, you know, track things. Then we figured out we could do the weather with it. And so that's a direct consequence of those innovations uh, during war. Uh, GPS and LORAN. So GPS is our satellite-based navigation. You guys are a bit old. Does anybody remember what LORAN was? LORAN was the predecessor for GPS. So LORAN was a bunch of a, a, a system of, of transmitters across the coastline that were beep, 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 beep at a specific frequency. And if you had a LORAN based receiver, you could get you know, tower one and tower two and tower three, and you could triangulate where you were. Just like with the GPS, it's just the GPS was satellite based. And, and therefore it was more accurate and, and you could do it farther off the coast, et cetera. We've essentially decommissioned most of our LORAN stations because people say, why would we possibly need that, right? We got, our, we got our super duper fancy satellites until the Chinese hack through and then you can't, <laughs> then you can't use your stuff. But that's another story. So, uh, uh, and then we have things like, as we mentioned, the hyper satellites and, and the aerial units. People are using drones now to find fish with these hyperspectral images and then all kinds of other uh, fancy tools. Another key reason for our fishery declines is this massive amount of bycatch that historically we've had. So we're targeting these tuna. Why? Because I have a business that sells tuna. I don't have a business that sells mahi-mahi. I don't have a business that sells these other things. So I go and I capture these critters and I can't, in my business model or, or because of my freezer space or whatever it is, I can't take all these guys. So I'm just going to cast them off. So I've killed those critters. So they are, ecologically, they're dead. 
but so what? I'm not gonna, we're not gonna use their protein. In other cases, there are things that are actually you know, legally disallowed. Maybe it's an endangered species. So sure as heck, I'm not gonna bring that back to the dock, right? You know what I'm saying? Because I'll get, I'll get totally dinged. But ecologically, it, has, it still has a consequence of nuking that, that community, that ecosystem. And again, bycatch, the definition of bycatch is just the capture of non-target critters uh, with fishing gear. And then the last major cause for, for driving fisheries to lower levels is overcapacity. So this is where our, when you, and you guys were involved with overcapacity in fish banks, right? So we got more and more potential to harvest. In your guys' case, you purchased more and more vessels. Then, then that fishery could support. Then that fishery could support. Huge problem. In terms of what happens with all of these consequences, um, we tend, to, or, or, or what happens when we start to overharvest? Certain things happen. One of the first things we start to do is so-called fish down the food web. So again, we started really high at relatively high trophic levels, and then once there's none of those guys left, we switch, switch to the next highest, and then the next highest, and the next highest, and the next highest, etc. Um, as we over fish and then the things become rarer and rarer we we tend to intensify our fishing effort and oftentimes that has the effect of of impacting especially the benthos especially the bottom coral reef um, uh, uh, rocky reef those critters uh, the, the, those regions excuse me tend to get hammered and degraded and then in turn they can support less fish themselves um, we tend to see trophic cascades where we um, have unintended consequences through the ecosystem knock-on effects from taking out this one member or these one uh, similar groups of critters from the ecosystem. And then lastly, we can see, uh, we, we, we uh, often see changes in life history. So the fish species change. They change when they have babies or whatever because of the intense pressure that they are experiencing. So fishing down the food web, habitat degradation, trophic cascades, and changes in life history are all um, consequences of over-harvesting. So this is the famous uh, illustration from Daniel Pauly's group up in um, British Columbia to illustrate this idea of so-called fishing down the food webs, but it's where we start with getting the big tasty fish and then over time, as we go through time, we're getting uh, smaller and smaller fish, which are at lower and lower trophic levels, eventually heading towards the, the harvesting of phytoplankton and, and those kind of critters. In terms of habitat degradation, I'll, I'll show you more of this when we talk about marine protected areas, but just as a, a, a quick, couple quick slides here. Um, on the left, this is an oculina, a deep sea coral off, of, off the Florida uh, coast. And on the left is a picture, I can't remember this one, I think it's from the early 70s, I think, or mid 70s. Um, and we see there, uh, th these, are, these are coral, but these are not coral that get their energy from photosynthesis. They're just, they're, they're you know, getting stuff out of the water column. So they're filter feeding stuff. And what you see there on the left is a lot of stuff and a lot of fish, a lot of, a, lot of, a lot of mobile critters associated with that habitat. On the right is after we've intensively trawled that, we've literally broken the very fabric of the benthos and we just don't get much stuff. The, these things can be really art articulate and all kinds of you know, really cool structures, but by and large delicate. Down deep, we don't have a lot of intense waves crashing on the surface, et cetera, as you guys know from our discussions about those areas. And so, so these, air, the, these structures tend to be relatively delicate, tend to be relatively slow growing. So when we impact them, it takes a long time for them to recover, longer on average than, a, than their shallow water uh, analogs. 
and we see this over and over again. This case is from Canada, but it's the same idea. We, we, we over trawl or, 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 or trawl too frequently. And as a consequence, we break the very fabric of the ecosystem. In terms of the trophic cascades, uh, what we tend to see is you can think of it as a so-called domino effect. So we change one aspect of the ecosystem and then other things start to change. So if we have a look at this, um, on the x-axis is time, again, going from back in the day on the left to more modern time. Uh, this example is from the East Coast, again. Sort of one of the, again, the classic case, it seems, these days. Um, and uh, and so, the, so the ground fish take, so all those things like cod and, and uh, those critters we already mentioned, um, those guys start to decline. And then we see uh, changes in, in other aspects of the ecosystem. And in some cases, some things do better, right? So you can imagine if I'm the, if I'm the thing being eaten by the cod, holy cow, I'm doing way better. One of the great beneficiaries for this short term, again, this is all short term, is you guys when you want to go eat lobster. Oh my god, the lobster halls have been record record takes of, lo of Maine lobster in recent years. That's actually a trophic cascade. Any guesses as to why? Or the like, specific mechanism? Right, so the cod apparently loved to mac on little baby lobster. So when the cod populations were high, they kept the lobster relatively low, right? Just like our story with the sea otters and the urchins and stuff. And so once we took the cod out, all of a sudden the lobster, boom. And so the, the lobstermen on the, in New England are like, this is great. Wow, man, lots of way more lobster. But in reality, that's the sign of an ailing system, a stress system, a system that's not functioning the way it should. And so these folks have lucked out in that one of those products is, is desirous at the moment, but long term that maybe doesn't bode well for our, our, our system. So trophic cascade. And then again, uh, changes in life history. One of the most common things we see are that female, female fish um, start releasing eggs at younger and younger years compared to the, the unexploited population. So they're, they're, they're maturing sexually earlier. And it's, it's again, it's, it's a, an evolutionary consequence. If they didn't, they'd be extinct, right? So the ones that tended to have, tended to, in the population, tended to release their eggs earlier or, or become sexually mature earlier, those ones are favored because only their genes are getting in the population. So you, you see this shift. Um, and, uh, and all, but, but ultimately, you're seeing, y usually you're seeing lowered reproduction because female, the amount of eggs is, is, is non-linearly related to size. So as the fish gets bigger, they can exponentially pump out more eggs. So in one sense, it's, it's sort of a survival strategy to have your, to make eggs earlier, but it means that you're not making ultimately as many eggs or as many healthy eggs as you otherwise would. And so this is just an illustration of all that stuff together, coming together to cause um, problems. So the next question, is that, that cool? Does that make sense? Any questions about that? Okay, so the next uh, thing would be uh, why, why, why are these, how come this happens? From a policy perspective, why does this happen? How come we just don't say, hey man, stop that? You guys have seen some of this in fish banks. So what are some, what are some of your guesses as to why we, here this quote says, overfishing occurs because all the economic incentives are in place for it to occur, right? That's what you guys experienced during fish banks. But, but give me some reasons. What, what are some more practical reasons as to why um, fisheries are allowed to decline. Money okay, short-term financial incentives, sure. People. people want it's 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 one thing to say, oh, let's take let's take uh, less fish now, but if you have you know a hundred hungry mouths, it's hard to not try to get food for the hundred mouths, right? Good. Um, yeah, we don't, that's the data 
good. Yeah, absolutely. So, so what's what are often referred to as so-called data deficient fisheries. We often, when I show these nice graphs, I show you the pictures of cod and everything. And you're like, oh my God, this is, why did this happen? In many cases, it takes a while for us to get those data. Or in other cases, we just don't have the resources, the time to go out and count all these critters, right? So there's many fisheries in the United States of America that we don't have proper data to make these decisions, to, to understand what their populations are like, et cetera let alone a lot of the developing world that, that don't have anywhere near our fiscal resources and technological resources. So that's an issue. What else? What are some other drivers? Like uh, specialized technology? Or uh, okay. Okay. Let's go, let's go with some examples. Okay, so the first is... Uh, Governments want it to happen by policy. The classic case, but by no means limited, but the classic case was the former Soviet Union. They would put out these honking, rusty, skanky, nasty vessels, totally inefficient, polluting, uh, very uh, non-discriminant in terms of the fish stocks that they would harvest. But they kept putting them out there. Why? Because of the Soviet Union. We're great. Of course we're a great fishing power. How do we know? Because we got great fish. You see the same thing coming from our executive branch today. Of course we're great. No, we're great because we're great. So that notion of pride, that notion of, of posturing, and of course we're going to be a player in here because we want to be a player, um, is a key key problem. So, so incentivizing at the policy level, at the governmental level, over capacity. Uh, secondly, as you guys mentioned, uh, just the population is getting bigger and bigger. So more and more people want food. So we need to get more food, at least in the short term, right? Even though ultimately that's reducing our ability to get food, you know, three years from now. Right now you have these folks that are hungry and starving. You know, we have 600,000 Rohingya that just moved into Bangladesh, right? 600,000 people. Merry Christmas. Well, how are we going to feed these guys, right? In, in a country that doesn't have a lot of money. So, the, you know, these things force our hand in many cases. So increasing demand. Shifting baselines. Somebody tell me about, somebody tell me about the shifting baselines. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, the example I always give of that is I usually throw a picture of uh, our house after my son was born and there's toys everywhere and everything's messed up. And, and that is clean. That was clean for us. Why? Because there wasn't skanky diapers around. There wasn't chunks of eggs sitting around. So right. back in the day, that would have been, oh my God, that's super messy. But then with the crazy baby running around, your, your, your acceptance level of what is clean shifts and you don't even know it, right? And so then you're like, of course it's clean. Why? Because there's no, there's no rotting food product on the ground or feces on the ground, right? <laughs> and so this happens all the time, right? All the time. We used to have extensive kelp beds off of Point Magoo. We don't have those anymore. But that seems normal. That still seems like a cool place, a healthy place to us. Our baseline has shifted and we're tolerant of degraded systems, um, and we see degraded systems as the norm, as healthy, as a desirous state, when in fact they are, they're highly changed. So that's the notion of shifting baselines. And then lastly, as you guys mentioned, the so-called data deficient fisheries. We don't have the, the real world objective, so-called fishery independent data. Why not? Somebody answer Steve, why not? Well, it's hard to count fish. It's hard to count fish, right? You gotta have dedicated vessels to go do that. You gotta have money to go do that. You gotta have equipment to go do that, experts that can do the counting. Right, exactly. So so that we're gonna fund that or schools. Come on, dude. What are you talking about? Right? So so a priority in one sense. Another it's just it's hard. 
a lot of these deep sea critters, it's just well, how the heck are we going to go down there? We're going to build an ROV and go down there and drive it around just so you can get your data? I mean, we would say yes, but most of the public are like, what the hell? You know, you weirdo scientist guys, right? So in some cases, it's a priority. In others, it's just logistically very, very difficult. It can be very, very difficult. Okay. So government subsidies, I don't, I didn't, I don't like my picture here, so I took it out. But, but um, <laughs> recently, uh, as of a couple years ago, one of the estimates from the UN was that we overinvest by to the tune of something like fifty billion dollars a year in too much ex so what you can consider excessive fishing effort uh, per year. That's insane, right? So surprise, surprise. So the, our economist friends would say, "See, this is a disincentive." <laughs> they would say. Everything would be fine if you didn't, oh, well, they might not say that, but, but some would say, if you didn't have these perverse incentives, you wouldn't, you wouldn't have the problem. I, I, I think we have lots of evidence that other things are going on, but, but that's one part of it. Um, again, that notion of more and more demand. So if we just look at China, just as China sort of started, opened up over those, that 40 odd years, they went from eating something on the order of 3.2 million tons of marine protein to 25.4 million tons. And it's only getting bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. And China's but one part of the world, a large part, very large part of the world, but still but one part, right? So more and more mouths to feed, more and more demand, more and more hungry people. Um, and then the lack of adequate fisheries data is, again, that notion of um, just we, you know, ideally we put a mask on and a snorkel and we go down and we look at these fish, but that's a very time intensive thing. It's a very logistically challenging thing. And, and only for a, a fraction of our critters can we, can we do that in any kind of efficient manner. Um, so our traditional fisheries management involves these four things. And then we're going to take a break because I can tell people are getting a little burnt. So uh, quotas. Which is saying, which is one of the things, one of the responses you guys suggested when we were talking about our uh, uh, what happened with fish banks is that we're taking too much. Well, let's just say people can only take X amount per day or per year or per season or whatever it is. All, that's also called total allowable catch. Now that could be individually based. That could be you, you, you know, you guys are only allowed to take X number of fish, or it could be the entirety of the fleet. And by, by having the entirety of the fleet do it, you know, once you get to level X, you stop for the season, that's why you get deadliest catch. That's why you have that reality television show. Because everybody races out the first day of the season and they try to get as much as they can because once the, the total quota is, cap, is, uh, is captured, everybody has to stop fishing. So that's why it's that really intense, intense thing that, that sets the stage for that reality television show. Um, we can try to ch change the gear, change the tools that we use. So we mentioned before that we're getting more and more efficient. We can try to counteract that efficiency by essentially making us less efficient with our nets, with our hooks, or whatever they are. Using this so-called notion, which is one of the main traditional ways of so-called MSY, or maximum sustainable yield, and trying to calculate that. That's, that's the, the most common. Uh, modern tool to use and then uh, simply closing off an area okay no matter what yep no I don't, I don't care type of gear timing whatever nobody's gonna take any fish from this area permanently or at least for the foreseeable future 